As the species barrels towards complete climate collapse, technocrats and politicians promise technological solutions for an existential problem. Hello guys and welcome to another episode of Thinking Out Loud. This week we've got a really awesome video for you. We'll be covering this article right here. It says, markets and technology won't solve the climate crisis. We must end capitalism. It's the accumulation of capital that's destroying the Earth system as a place of human habitability. So guys, this is a longer article and we will be doing a lot of reading. I'm going to try to go through this as as much of a clip as humanly possible, but there is a lot of interesting concepts that I want to talk about as we're going through this video. Um, namely, some of the contradictions that occur within capitalism, how those contradictions play out, and how those contradictions have a direct correlation uh, to the climate collapse. But beyond that, as we get towards the end of the video, I also want to talk about this concept of... Um, you know, this belief, subconscious belief that people have that it's easier, you know, it's easier to envision the end of the world rather than it is to envision the end of capitalism. You know, I think a lot of people are at the point now where they would agree with the concept that, you know, capitalism is uh, what's causing the climate crisis, what's destroying the planet. I think they understand that capitalism is the root of a lot of other issues such as wealth inequality um, and, you know, like p police repression, police oppression, state oppression, things like that. Um, but they might have a difficult time kind of envisioning what that transition uh, from capitalism to socialism might look like and what uh, developing a more, quote unquote, ecological civilization might look like. I think we are all so used to, um, you know, mass consumerism and our current modes of production right now that even for some of us that have maybe done a little more reading or have a, a, a greater grasp of these issues may also have a difficulty using our imagination to picture what a world post-capitalism, you know, current uh, ecological society might look like. So we're going to try to dive into that at the end of the episode and kind of ruminate and think out loud, as the name of the show always says, um, on what that may look like. All right, guys, let's jump into the reading here. Again, this article is from Truth Out. Markets and technology won't solve climate crisis. We must end capitalism. Uh, like I said, it's from Truth Out, and it's an interview, actually, between the reporter and um, a climate scientist or anthropologist that kind of discusses these issues and some of the concepts behind why he believes in his book, um, capitalism is the cause behind climate change. So it's going to be like a back and forth between the reporter and the person that's being interviewed. And it makes for a dynamic discussion. So we'll jump into the reading here, guys. It says, climate change caused primarily by capitalism's incessant burning of fossil fuels is happening faster than even the most pessimistic scientists predicted, causing freak weather events and mass displacement worldwide. From floods submerging one-third of Pakistan to temperatures of 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the Siberian Arctic, evidence abounds that rich countries better cut off their fossil fuel dependence fast. Among those rich countries, argues John Bellamy Foster in his new book, Capitalism and the Anthropocene, the United States is the epicenter. The U.S. military alone boasts a carbon footprint larger than that of many countries. Uh, you know, a lot of people watching the show probably realize that. But, you know, before we jump into more of the reading, I just want to note on that. The U.S. military alone boasts a carbon footprint larger than that of many countries. And we'll discuss some of this towards the end as well. But, you know, this existential problem of climate change and ecological collapse from pollution it feels like one of these issues that's, um, like I said, existential. De it feels deeply insurmountable, and we have no idea where to start. But then once you start looking into it and you look at what some of the top uh, polluters are and what some of the systems, uh, like, for instance, um, planned obsolescence and mass consumerism that create what these systems and, and institutions are that uh, are the main uh, perpetuators of climate change and global warming. Once you start like kind of analyzing that and picking it apart, you realize that this issue isn't as insurmountable as it seems. It is definitely existential. It doesn't diminish that fact at all. But you begin to realize that this is something that can be tackled. And it is a few systems and a handful, really, people that are causing it. And when we look at it that way, it becomes 
we can fill ourselves with a bit more hope and we can have a bit more direction of action, right? Um, we'll go ahead, and go ahead on with the reading here, guys. It says, but as many have observed, for many people, it's easier to envision the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Very true. When you start playing these mental exercises of what it would look like, especially if you don't have much of a, a, a background in, in studying, say, Marxism or, or, or the history of socialism and, and some socialist experiments throughout history, like how they've done it, it really is easier to envision the end of the world. And you could even say that some of the dystopic fiction that we have, science fiction stuff, which I'm a huge fan of. I mean, The Last of Us, I've actually got an Ellie figure right over here. Um, you know, The Walking Dead, I'm a huge cyberpunk junkie, like that whole genre between, you know, Neuromancer, the, uh, the video game Cyberpunk 2077, The Matrix. I'm a huge, honest fan of um, dystopic science fiction. But I think some, I like to think sometimes that the prevalency of that dystopic science fiction, and it, whenever you dive into this stuff, it's always capitalism. I mean, cyberpunk, it's obvious, ecological collapse. It's always rooted in capitalism. It's a mega corporation's fault, like in um, Resident Evil franchise, things like that. But I think a lot of that cultural fixation on that sort of dystopic science fiction is a direct result of the kind of subconscious unwillingness or inability to imagine a world without capitalism. But we, even though we are unable to imagine a world without capitalism, we know where capitalism is leading us into this death spiral, into a hell of our own making, but we still go on with it. Little uh, side note there, right? Um, Foster's book tells us that we have a choice, quote unquote, ruin or revolution. The reason for the necessity of revolution is that tinkering won't solve our problems. Technocratic fixes won't save the earth as a place fit for human habitation. And that's going to be one of the key points in this article here. The problem, as he told me in the interview that follows, is systemic. Capitalist accumulation, its endless growth, and its phenomenal waste. See, now, guys, we're starting to get into this interview here a little bit, and you can see the format. Uh, Eve Ottenberg, who is the reporter for this article, says, or asked the question, rather, the common conception is that the main environmental crisis is the climate catastrophe. But your book mentions that three planetary boundaries out of nine have already been crossed. Can you elaborate? John Bellamy Foster goes on to say, developing the concept of the Anthropocene, scientists didn't base it simply on climate change, but on the nine planetary boundaries. Climate change being one, the destruction of the ozone layer, loss of genetic diversity, ocean acidification, the disruption of biogeochemical uh, cycles, loss of ground cover slash forests, deforestation, loss of fresh water, chemical pollution, and the release of no novel entities and atmospheric aerosol loading. And obviously these are all boundaries that if we haven't crossed, like it says here, um, John Bellamy Fa Foster in his book suggests that we've already crossed three of these. Um, but quite clearly, even if we haven't crossed the quote-unquote boundaries to where these things are becoming an ecological crisis that is an existential issue, We've dipped, our, we've got more than a few toes in the water of these boundaries, right? Um, these boundaries are defined in terms of the Holocene, the geological epoch, which goes back 11,700 years in which civilization developed. The Earth system environment was very conducive to the development of civilization and prosperity for human beings. So on that, yeah, the Anthropocene, the Holocene era is the era in which all human life and development of civilization occurred and it occurred because it if you if you go back into pre deep prehistory even back to the time of the dinosaurs the environment would have been much more harsh for mammals in general but in particular human beings if not completely inhospitable something that we would have not been able to survive in but due to the natural cycles that occur you know ice age warming periods and stuff that occur mind you, over tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, we reach this little window in the geological scale of history upon which uh, deeply complex human systems of civilization could occur. 
And, and you can ask, well, why are human beings only able to thrive and truly develop complex um, civilizations in this um, very small window called the Holocene? You know, a lot of that is rooted in agriculture. Um, the, the food grains like wheat and millet and all these uh, type of things that we use as truly the main source of caloric intake – that allowed us to, you know, dry them and, and create surpluses that uh, can extend for a long period of time, which there in turn allows us to create a more pyramid structure of society, more specialization allows us to ve- develop technology, social systems, and things like that. Those grains, those foodstuffs that we are so dependent on that we use to feed our livestock for more protein, et cetera, et cetera, domestication of animals, uh, agriculture in general, that can only occur within a very small window of temperance, right, of climate temperance. And the closer and the further down we go to climate change, the more warming we have, the closer we ink our way towards complete agricultural collapse, right? Um, Famines, and when you have famines, you start looking at the fraying of society and its eventual collapse, right? We'll keep going with this here, guys. It says, in conceiving of the planetary boundaries, scientists codified various changes with respect to each boundary that signal moving away from the Holocene and into global ecological crisis. So all these boundaries, there's, you know, levels to it. Uh, like I said, boundaries that if we cross them, we're really starting to risk the saliency of human society due to environmental collapse, right? So far, we've crossed the boundaries for climate change, species extinction, and biogeochemical or phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. And we're in the process of crossing others, like I said. The chemical pollution boundary may have been crossed. Crossing each boundary constitutes a global ecological crisis that threatens the planet as a place of habitization, not just for human beings, but also for innumerable other species. The problem is that a lot of these things are irreversible. For example, we could end up killing off 30 to 50% of all species on the planet this century. That's completely irreversible. Um, So a few things here with this, guys. Um, you know, he talks, we are, have already crossed several boundaries, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, that one is almost triggered as a result of climate change. Um, as climate change, you know, melts permafrost and Arctic ice, we start releasing large amounts of nitrogen that starts to dilute the very, um, you know, fine line of balance that we have in our oxygen Uh, oxygen to CO2 levels, you know, the chemical makeup of the atmosphere, right? Um, That is what we need to survive as human beings, as somebody, as, as beings, as mammals that, you know, inhale oxygen, exhale CO2. When we start tipping the scales for a nitrogen and phosphorus release, it really starts to get risky for us as a, as a species that is completely dependent on a very fine cocktail of atmospheric um, gases, right? Um, but he mentions also that we're crossing other ones. Um, let's see here. It says, the chemical pollution boundary may have already been crossed. So what does that mean? I mean, when you think of the chemical pollution boundary, you, you think of maybe like toxic waste being dumped into a river or this or that. Um, but one of the things that we can relate to this that I'm sure we've all at least seen a headline about, even if we've been a bit too scared to look into ourselves, is um, like microplastics. Plastics in the ocean. Um uh, uh, you know, acidic rain, chemicals in the rainfall. So when you're looking at these things, you're starting to, if you if you kind of zoom out and then zoom in, you're starting to look at a situation where we have polluted to such a degree the things that we depend on for life that they, they cease to be just water or just oxygen, right? And microplastics is a great example of this. Like half the seafood you have now, is completely riddled with microplastics. It's even getting into the cattle and stuff like that. Because, And that's just crazy to think about. We've used that much plastic that it's permanently tainted all of us through its, uh, its contamination of the water and things like that. It's completely crazy. So that's some of the concepts he's talking about here, right? Um, the reporter goes on to ask, you argue, argue that the more elite technocratic and capitalist elements are in the driver's seat in the U.S. climate movement. No surprise. Can you explain? He goes on to say, we live in a capitalist society. 
Students sometimes think the system is democracy. I say no, the system is capitalism. And let's make a, a point on that. We'll discuss it at the end of this segment. Capitalism and democracy are not synonymous. We talked about this on this channel before. In fact, they're actually polar opposites, right? And the system, like any other, wants to perpetuate itself. Capital is geared to accumulation and growth. It's a class-based system of economic accumulation. So whatever you thought capitalism was, it's not what capitalism is, and we'll see here. And in all of these problems, crossing the planetary boundaries, there's one common denominator, and that's capitalism capital accumulation, and the growth process. And the powers that be, the ruling elements of our society, the billionaires, the ruling class, the capitalist class, the power elite that embraces those who are part of the political system, they don't want to change the system. It's their system and they want to keep it going even though we know that it's the accumulation of capital that's destroying the earth system as a place of human habitability. It's a complete fucking suicide run, isn't it? All right, guys. So there's a few things in this segment here that I want to talk, uh, talk about. Um, one of them is one of the core contradictions of capitalism here. It says, capital is geared to accumulation and growth, right? It's a class-based system of economic accumulation, so that is one of the core contradictions of capitalism, right? Especially in this modern era as we're reaching an existential crisis of climate change, right? Capitalism is centered in the idea of infinite growth. That's, that's the whole point. Every year the economy has to grow. It has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And not just that, it has to be compounding growth, okay? So in the article here, he talks about, you know, the 3% growth margin. If you read anything about economics, if you go to Ford's or anything like that, if the global economy or nation's economy hasn't grown by at least 3% GDP every year, they start having a little bit of a freak out, right? Because in capitalism, stagnation of growth is essentially a death sentence, right? Because the whole system is, is geared towards this uh, endless accumulation, right? So when it comes to this compounding growth, it's not just – Oh, 3%, we had that 3% growth of what the economy was last year or 10 years or 100 years ago. No, it has to be 3% on top of that already 3% on top of that already 3% on top of that already 3%. Okay. So I don't have exact statistics for you, but for example, if you go back to the real kind of coming of age moment of capitalism, right, in the world as we were more along the process of transitioning from feudalism to capitalism than we were in the other direction around 1890, let's just say, for a, for a date. If you look at that time period, the whole global economy was like, let's say, worth $1 trillion. That means there was $1 trillion worth of productive capacity and markets and, and whatever, whatever goes into an economy, right? Well, since then, the economy has doubled essentially every 25 years or so. Right, so 25 years after that, it was, it was two trillion, and then it didn't double from the one trillion; it doubled from the two trillion. So then it was, you know, four trillion, eight trillion, sixteen trillion, and now we're looking at a situation where I couldn't tell you the exact number of what uh, the size of the global economy is now, but to give it some scale, they estimate the GDP of the United States is 27 trillion dollars alone, right? So you, once you get to these numbers of compound growth. You're looking at what's 3% every year of a $100 trillion world economy. That's another, you know, 103%. And then what's 3% of that? Okay. And keep in mind that all of this is occurring on a very small planet with limited resources and limited space and, and, and limited amount of things to exploit. Okay. And it's not just small and it's not just limited. The whole basis that allows human beings to survive on it, the, the, the web of life, the circle of balance, right, is extremely fragile. And so humans have developed this system, this capitalist system of appropriation that all it does is consume and compound and grow and grow and grow, right? And it's going to completely and already is in the process of, of beginning to do this at an accelerated rate, it's going to rip apart the web of life, right? Like a virus or a cancer. And one of the things I want to touch on quick here before we go on to is a lot of times you'll hear um, 
you know, nihilistic people or, or eco-fascists use this phrase, well, humans are a virus. I've heard that so many freaking times, you know. Humans are a virus and there's nothing. No, no, human beings themselves are not a virus. We have seen throughout, uh, you know, many periods in history where human beings had a, throughout, honestly, most of history, there was, there's always going to be some degree of pollution where human beings, we excrete waste, we use things up. Okay, right? But throughout most of human history, we lived in relative balance with the, the superstructure of life, with the biological web. And it wasn't until capitalism came around, this idea of improving productive capacities, but having all that productive capacity go into a handful of individuals, you know, um, socialized labor, socialized production, but private accumulation of the pr wealth that's produced. It wasn't until we developed a system that really compounded that capitalism that we began to see true ecological degradation. So when people say human beings are a virus, I say no, capitalism is a virus, okay? Human beings are cells. Human beings are cells in an organism. Our societies can be looked at as an organism. A, a city can be looked at as an organism, right? Or an organ in the organism, right? With human beings being the entire organism, right? Uh, we divide and, and we grow and, and, and we thrive, right? There's nothing wrong with human beings doing that. That's, that's fine. That can exist, human society, human civilization. I believe even advanced industrial civilization can be in balance with the natural web of life. But the, the problem is, the virus is, the cancer is the system of capitalism. You could look at the system of capitalism as if it were that one rogue cell right, in the beginning, in the early ages of feudalism, what, however it started to take root, uh, going rogue and becoming a cancer cell. And then it divided, and then it divided, and it just started, you know, growing into this amalgam until it took over the entire system of human civilization, right? So when people say humans are a virus, humans are a cancer, I say no, capitalism is the virus, capitalism is the cancer, and we have ways and means revolutionary action, transition from capitalism to socialism, right? That can allow us to irradiate that cancer, can allow us to cure that cancer, but only if we have the political will to do so. And going along with that analogy, as he says here, um, you know, we have the power elite, all these elements in society that don't want it to change. They say they don't want to change the system. It's their system and they want to keep it going, even though it's what's destroy, you know, the accumulation of capital that's destroying the earth system. I mean, they're the cancer cells, that power elite, that political elite, that capitalist elite. Everybody, you can, you can think of everybody that has made their career in some ways supporting the capitalist system, right? As somebody that has been, you know, the pundits, the talking heads, the news media, the corrupt politicians, the military stooges, all these people, you can think of them in a sense as having been infected uh, by this virus, by this, um, by this cancer. And so those elements are people that are, are, are being co-opted by the, by the cancerous tumor growth. And these people, like it says in the article, just like the cancer cells, the cancer cells don't want to die. You have to go in there with radiation treatment and chemotherapy and all this other stuff in order to kill them. And that's what our mobilization is. That's what the development and education of socialism is. That's what social movements are, you know, gearing towards moving this system away, irradiating the cancer cells, right? We'll go on with the reading here, guys. It says, so the vested interests pretend that we can solve the problems with technology or with the market because they say the market is inherently efficient. And we can give you 101 reasons times 100 as to why that's not the case, right? The difficulty there is that, as every economist would admit, climate change is the biggest market failure in history. It's like... The variable in an equation, in a mathematical equation, and you know, maybe don't listen to me on this allegory because I am a math dunce, right? But it's like a variable in a complex mathematical equation that you can't quite come over. So you just kind of say, oh, the equation's perfect, but this. So we've solved it, right? That's what this is, them ignoring what pr uh, primitive accumulation of capital has done. That's the taking. Primitive accumulation of capital is the taking, the taking of labor power, the taking of natural resources, right? 
They've ignored that they're just taking from the thing upon which all the web of life is dependent on, including ourselves. It's a market failure. But a market failure is oftentimes written off as to what corporate stooges, corporate suits call an externality. Oh, that's a cost that we can push on to other people. And you see what it is. It's a mass migration as climate change de uh, destroys homes, right? The, the wealth inequality, the environmental toxicity, people getting cancer. These are all externalities that don't factor into the spreadsheet of the capitalist cancer cell, right? We'll go on here, guys. Um, and you can't really solve a problem with the same system that created it. Not a problem this big. That needs to be driven into the head of every single liberal. Okay, that insists that voting Democrat is going to do anything. It, I mean, it's just not. Right. Um, and of course, those in power don't want to talk about changing the actual social relations. That's the relation between the proletariat, all of us that do the work, and the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class that gets all the stuff that we did making our work, right? Or how we produce or even how we consume. They want to keep the system going the way it is, just like a cancer cell feels real good in the heart of the tumor, right? Since the market can't solve it, the powers that be say technology will solve it. Nice little pressure valve, right? And everybody believes in technology, as we should. Technology does amazing things, but technology isn't going to solve this issue. But technology can't break the laws of physics. And we've got a system here of exponential economic growth based on capital accumulation that's simply destructive to the pr planet. If you ha This is going on with what I was saying earlier. If you have a 3% rate of growth, in 100 years you'll have a world economy 16 times bigger than the present. In 200 years, 250 times bigger than the present. In 300 years... 4,000 times and so forth. That's that compound growth of the economy uh, that we we're talking about on a tiny little planet. So think about where compound growth, uh, endless accumulation, infinite growth has gotten us in just 100 years since the real coming of age of capitalism. Think about what it's done to our environment. Now times that. Use that compounding formula for another 50 years. It's insane. It's like drinking fucking bleach, you know? Um, but we're already reaching the limits of how we can live on the planet. We have to reorganize, do things differently. There are no existing technologies themselves that can solve the planetary emergency we now face, which requires a change in social relations. Now, just real quickly, let's talk about that changing of the social relations, right? Um, we have 8 billion people on this planet. But we have something called artificial scarcity, where some of the people on the planet live real, real high on the hog. They fly in private jets and things like that. And then we got like a middle section that's, you know, kind of us that live in the, in the first world, in the information age societies that have, um, you know, standards of living that are far beyond that of the rest of the world. And then we have everybody else on the planet that lives on roughly a dollar a day, right? Okay. We have the productive capacities, and we've said this in prior episodes, and it's something we'll say a hundred more times because it's important. We have the productive capacities, um, the ways of mining, the ways of producing energy, the ways of uh, manufacturing goods, the way of uh, producing enough food for every single human being on the planet to have an apartment and an education and health care and all this stuff, all the essentials, transportation of a modern society. We have all of that, right. But the issue is the social relations that we've created in capitalist society, that pyramid structure, right, where some people at the top get all, accumulate all of the stuff that we produce. And that leaves billions upon billions of people with nothing, right, right. And that system that creates inequality is also the system that creates climate collapse, right. So not only are we destroying our environment, by overproduction, over, uh, over accumulation, over consumption, and things like that. We're destroying the planet and not even providing for all the human beings on the planet. Right. 
The reporter goes on to ask the question, could you elaborate on the waste-based accumulation that characterizes U.S. monopoly capitalism and what that means for the global economic budget? He responds with, this comes out of economic theory. In the 19th century, we produced things that were used and needed, use values. Now, under monopoly capitalism, monopoly capitalism being that a handful of corporations own everything. They own everything. And they essentially own you through the uh, mode of wage slavery too, right? Now, under monopoly capitalism, it is a demand-constrained system. Because corporations have so much productive capacity, like we said, they can't utilize it. Or rather, they won't utilize it. Like we were talking about, they can utilize it. But we can't utilize it under current social systems, under capitalist systems. We can't just give everybody everything that they need to survive, right? We have to make profit off of it in order to get to that compounding growth of the economy that we discussed. Um, because corporations have so much productive capacity, they can't utilize it, particularly at the prices they set, because they set high monopoly prices. So there's always an underutilization of productive capacity, like we said. 25 or even 30% excess capacity is not unusual, say for the U.S. economy. And in this system, it then becomes oddly rational to produce a lot of junk and a lot of marketing to sell the junk. So again, coming back to the contradictions of capitalism that we're trying to drive at with this episode, right? Um, excuse me. Along with the infinite growth on a finite uh, planet contradiction, we have the, con the contradiction of overproduction, right? What is overproduction? In the past, one of the issues that human societies had was a limited production capacity, either through agriculture or manufacturing of clothes and, and trade goods that are essential for all human beings. We would have famines. Um, we would have shortages. You know, people lived in squalor because due to technological constraints, we did not have the productive capacity to produce for every human being on the planet. Right. That is, like I was saying, that is no longer an issue now. The way that we're able to produce things with robotics and mass production and assembly lines and um, mass commerce lines of trade and shipping and the movements of trains and, and giant uh, freight ships – there is no reason why human beings can't have everything that they need. But the issue is the capitalist, right? The capitalist owns the means of production. And he says, if I can't make money to add to that compounding growth of the economy, that profit line, then I am not going to let the human beings have what they need, right? And so what happens is the capitalist continues to drive down wages, depressed wages, make it so that workers earn less and less and less. Meanwhile, he's trying to produce more and more and more to sell to people that have less and less and less. And it reaches a line of contradiction where the people that are supposed to buy the product that work for the capitalist could no longer buy the product because they don't have the money to do that. And that's what's happened in the global south with billions upon billions of people living in want. And it's beginning to increasingly happen as a cycle here in the western countries as well. Right, So you have the contradiction of overproduction. They are producing so much that they can't sell it because they refuse to lower the price to a, to a level that people can afford. Right, This is the sort of thing that causes economic collapse. And it's truly insane when these economic collapses happen and people literally starve in the streets, especially in the global south. Because all the things that we need to live a comfortable life are sitting locked up in warehouses that the capitalist owns. You know, if aliens or God or whoever the fuck came and saw this, he'd be like, you guys are high. You're high. They wouldn't be any other explanation. They'd be like, he lost his fucking mind. If it was God, he'd be like, they've lost their mind, flood the place again. Right? And as we see with climate change, that's what's fucking happening. Maybe it's God doing it. Right? It's the absolute insanity of the contradictions of capitalism. And that's the thing about these contradictions is due to the nature of systemic social reproduction, a system that reproduces itself, um, 
Nobody will solve the problems until it's too late and the contradiction reaches a point where it's a tide that cannot be stopped. And one of the big worries is, is that we won't realize that these contradictions of capitalism are what, uh, you know, enough people won't realize that these contradictions of capitalism are what's causing the climate catastrophe before it's too late, right? Um, going on here, so says, so we spend trillions on marketing every year in the U.S. economy, trying to get people to purchase things they neither want nor need. We've all been there, right? I'm so sick of being advertised to. It makes me want to light myself on fire, honestly. That's what marketing does. The Marxist economist Paul Barron once encapsulated these this irrational situation by saying that we now live in a society in which we neither want what we need nor need what we want. I'll say that again. We neither want what we need nor need what we want. And that's completely antithetical to what has been the, the psyche, the, the case of the psyche for the human condition throughout all of human history. It's crazy, right? Um, in our society, we produce an enormous amount of material goods that are unnecessary, destructive even. I mean, that's your plastic bottles, that's your styrofoam, that's your cell phones that are made to go bad, so they go in a landfill. And that are un inefficient, like I was saying here, because they're designed for a throwaway society. Sorry. A throwaway economy. So that you have to go back and buy more. That's that planned obsolescence, right? That's why your phone goes bad. That's why your computer slows down. This fucking computer right here. Time for a new one. That's why your car goes to shit, right? Um, and we de-emphasize everything to do with the quality of life. So we try to convince people that if they want love or community, they can get it buying a Dr. Pepper. Now, see, I will say this guy has never had a Dr. Pepper, obviously, because if you drank the intense crispness of a Dr. Pepper. Like you can be sad and like, oh, my friend died and I'm sad because I'll never see him again. You drink that fucking Dr. Pepper, you're like, fuck it. Fuck it, dude. I mean, it's life, you know? So, he, you know, I don't want to apply what he's, I agree with what he's saying, but I don't want to apply it to Dr. Pepper because Dr. Pepper kind of is a cure-all, right? Same with root beer. That crispness, man, it just, it just, uh, but we can actually improve the quality of life by producing differently, by focusing on needs, focusing on genuine efficiency, and so on. Okay, so, I'm sorry, I keep bumping into this mic here, guys. Um, there is a few things I want to touch on here. Um, sorry, give me one second, guys. I'm just trying to get my thoughts together. Um, yeah. Yeah. In our society, we produce an enormous amount of material goods that are unnecessary, destructive uh, even, and that are inefficient because they're designed for a throwaway society. Okay, so one thing with this. We'll just we'll start here. Um, the planned obsolescence, we've already kind of talked about it. I won't get into it. I mean, you know what this is. It's why you have to buy a new phone every two fucking years if you're lucky three, right? Um, this comes back to that <clears throat> contradiction of having to compound growth. Um, infinite growth on a finite planet, right? So a lot of the growth we've seen in the last several decades under neoliberal capitalism is artificially inflated, right? It's not real. It's it, it's not actual use value in the economy, like was said earlier in the article, the, the need to, for use value for products, right? It's just mass consumerism for these products that have to continually be rebought uh, and, and thrown away and rebought, right? So if we look at that compounding growth principle, if we if we were to dissect it, it would be interesting to see how much of that uh, percentage growth every year is just on consumer goods that are going to be thrown away anyway. Single use stuff, planned obsolescence stuff, right? And so this is one of the contradictions as well with capitalism is it's not about producing the best product imaginable that's going to last the longest. And it's not about having the most efficient thing, right? The most efficient supply chain, the most efficient um, computer product or, or car. No, no, no. It's not about that. Efficiency, they always make the case that capitalism is efficient, right? And that it drives innovation. That's not true at all. All capitalism cares about is profit making more than it put in 
in dollars, right? All it cares is about growth. It doesn't care about efficiency. And you can look, look at many instances in society and in the economy and in products, consumer goods, where efficiency is purposefully flouted so that more of the product has to be bought, right? This is something we've seen. Like for a good example would maybe even be windshield wipers. I mean, you got to change them twice a year. I don't know. I'm not a fucking automobile guy. But but realistically, couldn't you make a, a windshield wiper that lasts several years? Like why? Or that you don't have to replace the whole windshield wiper. You just replace the lining once the seal's gone. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. But this is just an example of the ways in which capitalism is not efficient and it produces the mass amount of waste as a as a symptom, as a, as a prerequisite of the society that's causing the kind of pollution that's destroying the environment and inducing climate change, right? This part of the article also talks about quality of life, right? Um, and we de-emphasize everything to do with the quality of life. So we try to convince people that if they want love or community, they can get it by bu buying Dr. Pepper. So this is a... a I don't know if I would call this a contradiction. I suppose it, I suppose it is in a way. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy within capitalism, right, that uh, continues our drive to consume. Um, look at the way your day is laid out. Look at the way that the society runs. You work eight hours a day so you never see your family and you're perpetually exhausted. People that are lonely or scared or exhausted or depressed – or feel alone and completely alienated and uh, isolated from community, buy more, okay? Because human beings are social animals. Our entire basis is community, right? So when we don't have that, we start to go down, our, you know, we start to feel like shit inside, physically and mentally. So what do we do? Well, we buy that can of Dr. Pepper, which, mind you, is a cure-all. If you're feeling sad, drink that Dr. Pepper, right? But we do all these things. Oh, we buy the new phone. Okay, and I actually want to relate this to my own life quickly because I've recently um, been let go from a job, so I'm in between jobs, right? And at first it was kind of shocking, and I was super worried and super anxious because, you know, I only have so much savings. I'm, like, trying to make a game plan. Um, but then what I've found is how much less money I'm spending – not being in this eight hours a day, five or six days a week grind. I'm not commuting to work, so I'm spending $100 less, if not more, on gas. I'm not eating out because I have to eat in a hurry, right? And, and, and producing all the garbage that goes with eating out, you know, your paper bags, your plastic cups, all this type of stuff, right? I'm not impulse shopping for a shot of dopamine to my brain, you know? Because my dopamine feels fine because I'm spending all day with my partner. I'm working on her painting projects. I'm working with her. I'm seeing my daughter every day. I'm doing things around the house, working on my YouTube. So I also am, am, am fulfilling that human need to feel productive, right? So I, I, I realized like, oh, shit, like I can already cut out like a fifth of my usual budget every month that I've had to spend just to feel okay and to get place to place and, and be a part of the work grind, right? So that got me thinking about, wow, if that's just what I'm experiencing in this one situation where I still have economic anxiety because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have regular income coming in, right? But it started me thinking about, whoa, how much of the climate uh, crisis could be solved if we utilize those productive capacities in such a way where less people had to work and those people that do work have to work far less. Like how much would we cut back emissions and plastic pollution <clears throat> and mass consumption and, and waste of resources through consumerism if we just let, if we took care of everyone's basic needs and let human beings be human beings. And we saw an instance of this um, in the pandemic in the first year of the pandemic, when the global economy shut down and the only things being shipped were the bare necessities and people weren't driving to and from work for their jobs, that a lot of them are, are meaningless, uh, bureaucratic, you know, busy work jobs to justify their existence. We saw global emissions plummet in a huge way. We saw animals starting to thrive again. And it just makes you really realize and get towards that ecological civilization concept that we're talking about, that transition between socialism, right? 
what does an ecological so, uh, civilization look like? What does a transition from, so, to so, from capitalism to socialism look like? Well, it looks like a lot of things, but one of the things it looks like in that as socialists, as communists, as Marxist-Leninists, as activists, as progressives should be pushing onto people is the idea of a better quality of life, a true better quality of life, not mass consumerism, not nicer cars, not a fucking giant refrigerator that talks to you and will jerk you off when you're getting a milkshake out of the freezer. None of that. A quality of life of, of connection with community and human beings where you're working less, where you might not even have to work. If you're a parent, hey, you don't have to work. Just focus on raising that child. These are some of the things, and then we can see, as I gave in this example, how that reduces consumption and how in turn that reduction in consumption reduces carbon emissions and general pollution, right? This is some of the stepping stones of what building a social society or ecological civilization would look like. And just being unemployed for a little bit, if you took away that um, um, financial anxiety that I have to deal with, you know, oh, I have to do this odd job to make some money. If you took that away from me, I would be the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. And now imagine if we apply that to all mankind. It's a really beautiful thing to think about. Going into this next part, we're going to talk a little bit about green kinesium, things like uh, concepts like the idea of a green new deal. And we're going to get more into the tech aspects about how some of these capitalists and their pundits are pushing the idea of, of green capitalism, right? And why that's a fallacy and why that won't be enough to solve the ecological collapse. The reading here, guys, the reporter asks, some are advocating for green kinesium. Can you explain what that is? Um, I'm sure some of you guys are already aware of this. I mean, most of the people watching this channel are politically literate, but we'll do the reading anyway for those who may be new to this kind of concept. In Keynesianism, the economic problem is one of effective demand. Like we were talking about, it's trying to solve that contradiction between we have people that want and that need, but because of monopoly capitalism and the prices being set too high, they can't get what they need or want, right? Keynesium tries to reconcile that contradiction right um it's geared towards getting people employed to increase demand right because now they have the need or the the means to have demand green keynesianism attempts to merge ecology and the economy saying we can solve the ecological problem by creating lots of green jobs and I suspect having lots of green jobs is better than lots of, you know, dirty jobs like mining coal and, and pipelines and production of plastics, sure. Says, we'll create green things, green jobs, and expand the economy that way. So they're refusing to let go of that compound growth principle, right? That's one of the issues with Keynesianism. Um, instead of expanding the economy based on anti-ecological things. The problem is that it still wants to expand the economy, okay? The planet's only so big. There's only so many resources, and all the resources that we need for solar panels, green cars, all this type of shit, it's still coming out of the environment, right? Out of this limited source, out of this, you know, very delicate balance of life on the planet. The problem is that it still wants to expand the economy, still wants to increase consumption, still wants to increase the scale of everything, and that isn't realistic in physical, scientific, or ecological terms. It's impossible. Infinite growth on a finite planet, we'll say it again, impossible. It's not possible. So it promises a progressive approach to the environmental problem that will appeal to workers, but in some ways it's lying about the nature of the problem. So one of the things I want to talk about with green capitalism, this move towards green cars and solar panels and, and stuff like that. Now, we do need to do away with fossil fuels being the predom uh, predominant means of producing energy. I'm not an expert on this stuff. I've heard yes and no about nuclear. Um, I've heard positives and negatives about solar panels. But I'm going to go on a whim and, and, and say that any of these are better than burning fossil fuels because inequivocally, like it's it's it can't be understated, the burning of fossil fuels to power our economy is one of the main driving forces that, and everything else kind of comes second to it, right? Um, but the issue with this is that it still consumes, right? It's still based on consumerism and growth, right? 
and the the minerals from solar panels have to come from somewhere the minerals in your in your green car for the battery have to come from somewhere and as we've seen like lithium leaching pools and i mean these are still incredibly dirty industries they might have less co2 emissions but they pollute and destroy the environment the natural balance of life in other ways and so one of the points i just want to drive home quick here with this is technology isn't going to be the answer more consumption, more individual consumption isn't going to be the answer. Like it said many times in this article, the change in social relations is going to be necessary. The way that we consume is going to uh, have to change. Okay. It shouldn't be, we shouldn't be talking about everyone has to have a green car and that's going to make a difference. You know, it's a lot less wasteful than everyone having a green car. Everybody being able to get on a train, an electric train. Okay, if you if you cut in half the amount of people that have to have a car to get to where they got to go and you put them all on an electric fast traveling bullet train. Right. Just that um, just that alone. How much less resources does that use and how much less carbon emissions does it produce? Just half the people on a planet that drive no longer having to drive or own a car so that a car doesn't have to be produced and managed. How much does that cut everything? Okay, so that's the sort of thing we need to be considering, okay? You know, more public spaces to get things done, right? Instead of a bunch of private restaurants or having to go to the store to produce your own private meals, you know, maybe more community kitchens where it's good quality food and everyone's eating together. You know, more um, public laundromats that you're not getting fucking charged for where there's, you know, people using the same... Uh, laundry uh, facilities rather than everyone having to own a washer and a dryer in their home, right? If you do that and you completely change the social relations and, and, and the culture around individualistic consumption, if you do that worldwide, I mean, I feel like you're halfway there to fucking tackling the climate crisis and all the other ecological crises as well, right? Because if you think about it, what human beings – need to survive food, water, healthcare, um, entertainment, art, like what we really need to, to survive and thrive as human beings, we don't really need that much, right? And I'm not saying we go back to being primitive fucking cavemen and we smash our computers and go, unga, unga, uh, uh. it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the things that we do have to produce to live in a digital eco, uh, information age society should be produced in such a way that they carry on for a long time. And if they need to be upgraded because there's been technological advances, it's in a part or a piece that helps. Like, for instance, you know, computers are always getting better all the time, right? But the computer slows down to such a degree that no matter what I do, an example, my own computer, I have to get rid of it and, and, and do another one, right? It, instead of that, you know, we could have parts that we trade out in our phone or in our TVs that make it better. I mean, this is just an example. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know. But if we start thinking realistically about the ways in which our society and the way that we consume can be different, we're winning half the battle of envisioning a world that can be different, right? Going on with the reading here, guys, says, Will an environmental proletariat arise in the global south? I often think in terms of Engels, the condition of the working class in England, one of the great works on the Industrial Revolution written in 1845. It was all about the epidemiological problems faced by the working class, the disease, the pollution, the bad food. But we tend to think of the proletariat or working class in terms of economic factors, simply in terms of factories. But the times when the proletariat or working class has been most radical is when faced with not simply the degradation or exploitation in the workplace, but also the destruction of their environment, including, of course, the urban environment. We've separated the economy and the environment in our society. And I think they're becoming less separated. People are being forced into a more materialist view in which the environment and the economy are both material aspects of our reality that are interrelated. Yeah, it's really interesting that that division that people have had, that it's been made culturally, it's been kind of pushed on us that the economy and the environment are separate. You know, that 
separation of realities has been necessary to sort of manufacture the consent for the destruction of the environment, right? You know, it's made it's made it palatable for people. But I think people are waking up to the reality that these things are inextricably interwoven. But I want to, you know, have a philosophical side note here just real fast. Um, when you think about this separation between reality, between the economy and the, and the environment, it's almost pseudo-religious, isn't it? Like a, it's almost like a religious ideology, right? Like the, div, the, the belief in the divine being being above and beyond this material plane. You know, we always hear the concept or, 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 or the phrase that we worship the money god in the society. God, money is God in America. And I think that is very true. But beyond that, we take it to the next level. The economy is God. It has supplanted all religious deities and even if you're not religious, all, um, you know, kind of existentialist philosophies, nihilistic, absurdist, what's the meaning of life? The economy has supplanted all of that. And it's become, become above and beyond not just the environment, but the human soul as well. And again, I'm just thinking out loud here, but that's maybe just a, you know, a, a bit of bacon fat for you guys to chew on in your own mind. It's something that I think about. You know, quite often I've written about in some of my, you know, short fiction and things like that. Going on with the reading here says, this is being forced on people in the global south even faster than here. So in Pakistan, where 30% of the land was flooded in this year, that's crazy, 30%. Imagine, just say, like for me, I live in a small town. Imagine 30% of it being underwater. It's crazy. Now, zoom that out to a whole country, right? Um, 33 million people were affected. You can believe that people are now involved in material struggles that are just as environmental as they are economic. There is no economy without an environment. You know, I've heard people say, I'm sorry, the economy is just more, jobs, economy is more important to me than the environment. Bitch, they ain't no jobs, they ain't no economy if there ain't an environment because there ain't no people to fucking do the jobs because they're all dead. Right. Um, think about being deprived of food. Is that an environmental or an economic problem? People will think more in terms of environmental struggles as an essential part of their material reality as their position as workers. You can see this happening all over the world. This is really a hope for change. And as we see people make more and more people make this connection, we can get closer to building sort of mass movements that will be necessary to overturn the systems that are causing this ecological crisis, right? Could China be the global leader in promoting ecological civilization in the Anthropocene? So any of you that follow China as much as I do, you've known that one of the things that came out of, was it the 20th um, uh, Congress of the Communist Party or whatever, um, one of the big things that Z talked about and other officials talked about is building, moving away from the sort of focus on economic development and growth they've had and moving towards a more ecological society. And we've seen China do a lot of amazing things in that. In, in the last 10 years, I mean, they had severe issues with pollution, deforestation, urban sprawl. And while not perfect, they've made a lot of advances in trying to tackle these things. That's certainly a lot more than anyone in the West has done, right? especially when you consider the scale of their society in terms of population and just overall land mass as well, right? We can get uh, his uh, opinion on this here. It says, we can hope so. They actually have a plan to peak their carbon emissions by 2030. Initially, it involves expanding carbon emissions and then a rapid downshift. I don't know if this is going to happen, but the fact that it's a very serious effort is important. They've already, they're already the leader in solar in the world, in alternative technologies and reforestation. They've done a, a huge de-desertification reforestation program. I think they've I think they planted like a billion trees in one year and they have a whole civilian conservation corps type of program that really actually puts the one that we had in the 30s to shame, honestly. Um Let's see. They've done more recently, they've done more recently to reduce pollution than any other country. But there are a lot of struggles in that society. There are massive environmental movements in China, and I'm on their side. But without China going towards ecological civilization, as they call it, it's difficult to see how the world's going to get out of this mess. 
because there are such a large part of the world population and production, so we have to be on the side of that effort. Um, their plan to peak in 2030 is really set in stone. They've got a very detailed operation going on and a lot of Western environmental movements think this is realistic and offers hope. So we just have to see. Our whole situation worldwide is really dangerous and untenable now. But if we're going to get out of this mess, we have to look for where the hope lies. What are the things that seem realistic that will lead us in the right direction? My hope is based on the movements on the ground everywhere in the world, including China, that are having an effect. What we know is there's going to be a struggle over this. Humanity's going to struggle over this. It's a question of whether you're going to join the struggle. All right, so that's the peak of the reading here, guys. Um, you know, reading some of this last bit with China and the ecological society, you know, it, it has me coming. One of the main things I want to talk about is we're beginning to see in one way or another – in, in a greatly uneven way, the development of the global south, the development of the developing world towards being a more advanced industrial society. Um, and anyone that follows climate science even loosely can see and knows the effect that that's going to have on the ecological crisis. Um, because all the people in the global south, they deserve national sovereignty, economic sovereignty and the people living there deserve a modicum of human dignity a modicum of economic dignity food water shelter shelter educate all the things that we take for granted to a certain degree here in the west everybody on the earth describes that or deserves that i'm sorry but the issue becomes again this is only going to compound the environmental crisis there's no way around it. More people consuming, more people having a, a higher quality of life like what we're used to. There are elements that would suggest that, you know, eco-fascist elements that would suggest that, no, fuck them. They can continue to wallow in filth and they have to have some responsibility for, you know, green development. But that ignores the fact that all, any green development we're able to do here in the West is a result of the over-exploitation of the global south. Right. And I would agree that the global south should develop in a green way, but they do not have the productive capacity or the financial assets or the or the systemic or the social or systemic infrastructure necessary to do that. It's not there, but it can be there, but only with the help of the global north. You know, and so we start talking about um you know, environmental reparations, green reparations. You know, we have to be doing all this in our in the global north and western societies, but we need to be extending that to the global south. And we can look at that as a, a, a payback, a, a paying it forward to the people that we have overexploited for hundreds of years, who live in in, in, in neo-colonialism and degradation as a direct result of our systems that have exploited them. And if you can't get on board with the justice aspect of it from that perspective, you have to get on it, get on board with it from the perspective of if we don't help them green transition, anything we do here in the West isn't going to matter. The existential nature of climate change transcends borders, nationalities, religions, and political ideologies. We're all in this freaking little blue dot of a boat together and there's no denying that and you can't reconcile the any other way and if we are going to get out of this together we have to work together plain and simple but yeah guys that's essentially all i have for you um i hope i've touched on everything i've did the reading in the article i hope i've given some analysis on the ways in which um some of these 
capitalist contradictions, these contradictions of capitalism manifest themselves. And I hope I've been able to connect the dots at least loosely enough for you to make your own uh, decisions on it and how these contradictions are causing the climate collapse. Um, in regards to the ecological society and how transitioning from socialism uh, from capitalism towards this ecological society, I'd like to get a comment thread going with your opinions on like what this would look like. Do you have articles that you want to share with me uh, that kind of uh, outline a, a sort of structure or, or processes of what it would, may look like? You know, just drop your opinion. Do you think we're going to get out of this mess? Do you think socialism and ecological society, like some of the things China's been doing, is a great example of a method that can be adopted by the rest of the world? Go ahead, drop a comment with any of your thoughts on this subject. It's incredibly, you know, complex and, and fascinating, and I think we can really have a great discussion about it. So like I said, go ahead and drop a comment. Let me know what you think. Uh, but beyond that, guys, as you know uh, from the introduction of the welcome video, I have revamped completely uh, the new Patreon. You can join for as little as $1 a day. We're trying to make some fundraising goals so that, you know, I can work less. I'm a working class dad, and I want to make this a full-time thing. And I hope you guys will support me in that effort, in that goal to produce more content and do this full-time by becoming a patron for as little as $1. We're doing all kinds of community aspect stuff on there, community ranking, uh, every roll credits of the episode will have a thank you for every single individual patron, exclusive posts for me, including more personal stuff. Every episode of Thinking Out Loud, every single clip, interview, any content that's coming to the channel will be released early access early day, uh, several days in advance on the Patreon. Um, all kinds of things, guys. We're doing behind the scenes. Um, and all that's available for $1 a day. So I hope you'll join me on there and support this channel and help me take it to the next level. But again, guys, that's all I have for you. Um, as always, you know the drill. I love you very much. Thanks for hanging out with me. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again soon. Bye.